Hi friends, thank you so much for joining us for this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy's. We would love to have you join us every Monday night at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel from 7.30 to 8.30 in person. But if you live far away, you weren't able to be here this week, you're not able to get to us, we're so happy to have this recorded and available for you online so you can still participate. So while you're here, please make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you get notified every time we have a new video, whether it's a Bible study or some other content that we're putting out there. And please leave your questions and your reflections in the comments below so that we can answer those, we can get to know you, and that you can share with all those other people who are watching online. So without further ado, please enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study. God bless. pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for all you've blessed us with, all the ways that you've surprised us with your grace today, especially the ways that went unnoticed. We thank you, Lord, for all of the ways you are constantly seeking us, chasing after us, and loving us. And tonight, Lord, we pray especially for the ways where we feel doubt, we feel worry or fear or anxiety, or we doubt maybe your plan or your will for us. And we pray, Lord, just that you would uh, convict our hearts in an encouraging way, help us to recognize those spaces within us that lack trust, and meet us there with your love. Send your Holy Spirit upon this time, bless us each in the ways that we most need it, and remove from our minds and our hearts any distraction, any worry, any presence of evil, anything trying to take us away from this time. We cast those things out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we entrust all this time to our Blessed Mother, through whose intercession we desire to grow closer to you as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Tonight we are in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. This is the gospel reading for this upcoming Sunday, which is the 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So last Sunday, yesterday, was the Feast of the Transfiguration. So we ended up skipping over the 18th Sunday of Ordinary Time. So we would have normally read the passage right before this, the return of the 12 and the feeding of the 5,000. So it would have been one of those instances where we hear Jesus feeding the 5,000 people the uh, episode that occurs in all four Gospels. So this is occurring tonight, immediately after that. So immediately after Jesus has fed the 5,000, this is what we are reading tonight. So you've heard this passage many times before. It's the story of Jesus appearing to the disciples, walking on water. And so I invite you, try and remove any image you have in your mind of this story. Okay, try and act as though you've never heard this before. Pay atten attention to your senses, to every detail, Act as though this is brand new information for you as we read through this our first time. So Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33, the walking on the water. Then Jesus bade the disciples get into a boat and precede him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the, bo the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, 
Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So, familiar story. Maybe you have new insights or a new image in your mind. We're going to read this a second time. And the second time, I invite you to listen uh, very attentively to the words as they are read. See if a particular detail, word, or phrase strikes you, stands out to you for any reason. It doesn't have to be to interpret the passage or to say something theologically profound. It could be the word the stands out to you for some random reason. Whatever it is, pay attention to that. Why is that speaking to you? What is Jesus saying to you through that detail or that word? And just reflect on that. What is the Lord trying to say to you personally through this passage? Our second and final time through, Matthew 14, verse 22, the walking on the water. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to reflect back over this passage and the things that stood out to you. And I take a few moments to uh, kind of see what those things were, reflect on them. And then at your tables, I invite you to just discuss what stood out to you and why. What questions do you have about this reading? If you're watching this later, let us know in the comments. But for those of us here, take about the next 10 minutes to do that. And then we'll bring it back to the larger group for further discussion. So a few uh, notes about this passage to put it in context. Um, the first is uh, the Hebrew idea of water and the sea. Uh, if you look throughout Scripture, at the very beginning in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, um, it doesn't say that God created the world out of nothing. It says in Genesis 1, chapter 1, In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss, and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. So this idea that darkness, chaos, God bringing everything into order happened after this kind of dark, watery chaos existed. And at the very end of the Bible, uh, first in Revelation 13, one of the beasts of Revelation that represents the devil or his servants comes out of the sea. And so the idea of large bodies of water or the sea were actually very terrifying to the Jews because that symbolized the abode of the dead, the abode of the evil one, where the demons dwelled. And I mean, if you've ever been at the ocean during the day, you know, you have this like great experience where like, oh, I want to go body surf and I want to go be, you know, and you go to the same spot at night and you're like, I'm not going anywhere near this, like nothing on my toes. I don't want to step in there. Like it just is this big looming mass of dark water. And the Sea of Galilee is pretty large, appearing very much like an ocean at certain parts. It's 13 miles across, north to south, about 8 miles wide um, at its widest, west to east. And so they're about 3 to 4 miles in. So they could be near kind of the bigger middle part of this small, seeming like a sea or ocean to them. And they are floating above what they all believe to be the abode of darkness, the abode of chaos, the abode of the enemy. And so... 
fishermen, I think, at this time were kind of like, I like to think of them as like the bad boys of like ancient Israel because like they're out there like floating on the, the like the realm, the top of the realm of hell all the time. You know, I just imagine them in like leather jackets, like we're not afraid of this, you know, just like going across this realm of the dead or this realm of evil. But this particular storm got so bad that even these seasoned fishermen are scared. Imagine how bad and terrible that must have been. And then all of this imagery about not only if I die, I'm going to be plunged into the water and drown, but I'm actually going to be in the abode of the evil one. I will be snatched by the enemy. That was very much probably the thoughts going through their minds. This is why it's so terrifying when Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospels, um, it is better for you to have a great millstone hung around your neck and for you to be thrown into the sea other than leading one of these little ones astray. That would have been a very severe action or punishment or idea, an image for the Jewish people to be terrified of if they just cause any amount of scandal to the young people that Jesus is referring to. That's was their, that was their image of the ocean of the sea. Okay, so imagine that, and then you're in the middle of the storm. It's as if there's this battle raging between good and evil, and they're kind of caught in the midst of this. So no wonder they're kind of smack dab in the middle of Matthew, right in the middle of Jesus's ministry. Many of them still wrestling probably with who this Jesus person is, wrestling with their doubt. Peter has not yet proclaimed, you are the son of the living God, as he will in Matthew 16. We've, the only proclamation we've had of that is straight from God himself at the moment of Jesus's baptism. And so there's still this kind of maybe hesitancy to admit the power of Jesus or who Jesus is. They're following him, they're being faithful, but there's still potentially this doubt in many of them. And we can also experience this doubt. So this is a really good lesson for you and me in the moments where we feel we're encountering darkness, we're experiencing doubt or hesitation in our faith. Maybe we feel like God's plans for us are not for our good. We feel like God at times might be out to get us or out to trick us or put us through a trial to, you know, um, help us grow in some way. And that's not how God works. And so this is a really good passage to illuminate that idea if you've ever wrestled with that in your own mind and your own heart. And so that image is important, the Jewish conception of water and the ocean. And then we come to the scene where Jesus is physically walking on the water. This, um, I don't know if you know this, but the Genesis is probably not the most ancient of the texts that we have in Hebrew. It's probably actually the book of Job. The language in Job is so ancient, it comes from that time period, probably older. And what I mean is when it was physically written down. Genesis, the events of Genesis obviously happened first, you know, but when it was physically written down, Job potentially predates that. And there's this passage in Job, Job chapter 9, verse 8, where Job um, is talking about God. And he's describing this God who has allowed all this suffering to happen in his life. And he says, God alone stretches out the heavens and treads upon the back of the sea. And there are many places in the Old Testament elsewhere where God himself is depicted as someone having mastery over the sea. Psalm 77 verse 20 says, Through the sea was your way, your path through the mighty waters, though your footsteps were unseen. Isaiah 43, 16 Thus says the Lord, who opens a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. And one more in Isaiah 51, verses uh, 10, and, or yeah, verse 10. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? You who made the depths of the sea into a way for the redeemed to pass through. Many of these referring back to the passage of the Hebrews through the Red Sea during the Exodus. And so all throughout the Old Testament, we see that God has this command over the sea. He has power over the sea. He can tread upon the sea. And then what do we see? Jesus coming, doing that very same thing, walking upon the water, claiming in a sense, I am the God of the Old Testament that you have heard these verses about, that you have studied in your synagogue schools, these things you've heard describing God the Father, that is who I am coming to show you that I am. And what does he say to them when they, they are afraid? He says, take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. This is a really key, powerful verse here. First of all, I love that he says, take courage, because the actual translation of that is, be of good cheer. Now, can you imagine being on this tiny little dinghy of a boat in the middle of an ocean, feeling like you're going to get flipped over and plunged to your death, and some being comes walking on the water and is like, hey, be of good cheer. You'd be like, what is happening? You know, like I found it funny when I was reading this in kind of a calm voice. It's like, Lord, save us. Like it would have been like blood curdling scream. Like, really, Peter, you scream like a little girl? Like they would have been like that. Like just total emotional guttural reaction to the fact that they were about to perish. And this is what Jesus says. Be of good cheer. 
And then he says, it is I. But in Greek, the translation is ego emi, I am. Where Jesus is professing the name of God from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses asks God, if anyone tells you, uh, asks me, who sent you? What is his name? What do I tell them? God tells Moses, I am who I am. This is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So not only is Jesus walking on water, claiming the power of God that is present throughout the Old Testament scriptures, the ability that only God has to tread upon the waters, he is now saying the forbidden, holy, and sacred name of God out loud, claiming it for himself. And because of that, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. There is nothing to fear because I am with you and I am and the incarnation of God himself here present with you, even in the midst of your fear, even in the midst of this storm, even in the midst of it seeming like total darkness and chaos is surrounding you in your life, I am here. And then Peter does the most insane thing ever. For some reason, he doesn't just say like, hey, can you come get in the boat and help us? He says, if that is you, command that I come out to you on the water. Command that I, he's literally saying, give me the ability, tell me that I am able to walk upon the face of darkness, hell itself, and keep my eyes fixed on you, and not succumb to the power or the grasp of the enemy. That is powerful. That is bold that Peter is willing to do that. But we know what happens. He steps out in faith, and then he sees the size of the storm, and he begins to sink. And he cries out immediately. This is a great lesson for us. In the moments where we feel like we're sinking and the storms of life are too big, do we immediately cry out to God? Do we cry out, Lord, save me? Or do we cry out, why me? Do we complain? Do we whine? Do we place blame? Or do we simply bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, save me? And my favorite note about this passage, as soon as Peter says that, what is the very next word? Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand. No hesitation. Immediately, he was there. And he looks at Peter and he says, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, some people think this is Peter doubting in Jesus. And that could be true because in Matthew, we actually have two instances where storms are calmed. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, this is the scene where Jesus is in the boat with them. And they're worried about the storm. And they come to him and they said, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And he says this, why are you terrified, O you of little faith? Just six chapters ago. And he calms the storm. And it says, the men were amazed. What sort of man is this whom even the winds and the sea obey? They're not yet willing to make the claim they come to at the end of this passage that truly you are the son of God. So note that like Peter and the disciples have already seen Jesus has the power to calm the storm. But now he's not in the boat. There's a separation. There is a need to go to Jesus, to get to Jesus through the darkness. And so Peter begins to sink. And Jesus used those same words, kind of like a really holy, gentle, I told you so, you know, using that same phrase he used just a short time ago, the last time they were in the middle of a storm. And that must have really cut at Peter a little bit to, to just be pointing out that doubt that he potentially had in Jesus. But I also think it was a doubt that he may have had in his own abilities. Because I think that happens for us too. I know it happens for me that sometimes I look at the storms of life. I look at the position that the Lord has called me in or the things that the Lord has called me to do. And I think like, oh man, like I can't, I can't weather this storm. And a lot of days it can feel like I'm sinking or like the storm is too big. It's too difficult to, to traverse on my own. And what a great reminder that Jesus is standing here kind of before us on the water saying like, yeah, you can't do it on your own. You will sink. You will sink recognize I can calm the storm. I can calm the storm. So a lot of other little things in here, but those are the things that were really speaking to me that I wanted to make clear about some of the Old Testament imagery. One other uh, link before, before we open it up um, to the Old Testament and to the, those scenes of Moses, right? Saying the name of God revealed to Moses, uh, walking through the water like Moses in the Red Sea is the detail that this happened in the fourth watch of the night. Because in the fourth watch of the night, that was about between 3 and 6 a.m. It was the final watch before daybreak. It was believed in kind of some Hebrew cosmology that that was when the powers of darkness were doing their final battles and starting to recede back into their places of the sea. But it's also the moment in Exodus chapter 12 or 14 where Moses extends his hand out over the Red Sea after they've all passed through. 
And it says, as soon as it was daybreak, he does this and the waters closed over the Egyptians. So all of that crossing the Red Sea, if that happened as soon as daybreak, all happened during the fourth watch of the night. That was when God led the people through the storm and the waters of the Red Sea, through the oppressive attack that was coming from behind, and provided a way to deliver them. And only at that moment of daybreak, once the fourth watch was over, do the waters close. The only other time we have a detail like that that I'm aware of is in Genesis chapter 32, where Jacob is wrestling with God uh, at Bethel, I believe, or what will soon be named Bethel after. And it says he wrestled with God until daybreak. So through the fourth watch of the night. And that wrestling imagery here, like the storm wrestling with the boat, I find also very poignant and would probably have been been being called to mind by people who first heard this. Do you remember the wrestling in the Old Testament? And pointing to these people like Jacob, who is a figurehead of Israel. Pointing to people like Moses, who Jesus is coming to be the new Moses and reveal himself to be the son of God. All of that would have been very clear to the Jewish readers and those experiencing this, the disciples here in this boat. So, what stands out to you? What other questions do you have about this passage? Yes, Greg. Especially based upon what you just said about chapter Mm 8, the fact that they had the experience with Jesus in the boat, Mm -hmm. and they woke him up, and I think it was like perturbed or something like that. Yeah. It says you have a little faith. So they have that experience. And Peter is with his, with his brothers, his other family members. He's close to the other people in the boat. Some of them, yes, yeah, absolutely. Close to them, so. Yeah, and now they've been traveling together, so they're all, well, you know, very close at this point. Yeah. So they're there in the boat, and the second instance comes along. And I'm struck with, it seems to me that Peter's just thinking about himself. Mm. And the Lord called, you know, he calls to the Lord, let me come to you, and that's all very nice. But what about, what about the other people are scared, you know, on the boat with him? Mm. You know, I mean, uh, he knows they were all scared in the boat for a while before they saw Jesus. They were away from shore for a while. Mm-hmm. And so here comes Jesus, and he was just willing to get up and split. Yeah. I think this is, to speak to that, this is one of the places where we see the leadership of Peter being exercised. That it's clear that Peter is the one who's willing to take charge. Even if he does it very haphazardly and in a very human way, as he often does, he's at least the one who's willing to step out in faith. He's the one who's willing to utter, you are the son of, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God in Matthew 16, which if it was untrue would have been blasphemy and worthy of being stoned to death. So Peter is willing to kind of say the bold thing, do the bold thing, even if he doesn't always think through the consequences. And I think that bravery is something That's characteristic of why Jesus chose him to be the first leader of the church, why it was necessary for him, facing such persecution in the early centuries of the church, to bring the church to its fruition where it could grow and then be passed on that authority to others. And so I think part of it is Peter just maybe had that role and and he was being kind of um, trained in that by Jesus to be that person who was willing to step out on behalf of others. I also think that, there, you know, The scene at the beginning where he tells them to go, and then he goes up by himself to a mountain to pray, and then it says he was there alone. How do we know that? How do we know that he was there alone? The only reason Matthew could have known is if Jesus told him. So what's the point in Jesus telling him, I went up to a mountain to pray and I was there by myself? Because he wants to model Prayer in the midst of the storm. Jesus knew the storm was coming. It's very clear from the context. He he knew the storm was coming. And he did not prevent it. This was something that really spoke to me as I was reading this earlier this past week. Was that, I wonder how many storms have happened in my life that Jesus calmed before I even realized they were raging. I only experience the storms he lets happen. Like, how many storms in your life did Jesus calm before you even knew they were happening? Like, think about that mercy that he extends to us. It just goes completely unnoticed. And that's a beautiful gift. But do we grow? Do we learn anything? Do we even realize that? Not really. And so there is kind of a, a, a positivity to the fact that Jesus lets us endure these storms. And he allowed the situation to happen where he could call out Peter to be an example because he wanted to show them something. He wanted to teach them something. 
And he knew this would play out exactly as it did. He could have prevented it. He could have been with them. He could have let it play out exactly the same way as before while he's with them in the boat and calm the storm, but he chose not to. And I think because there's the distinction between the first storm, when they're all together, no one is called out, Jesus is with them, and this storm, when Jesus is not there, and Peter is the one who takes initiative to go to Jesus, to bring a lifeline to Jesus. I think that is such such characteristic of what's needed in a leader. That when we don't know what to do in the sources of, in the, the, what am I trying to say? We don't know what to do in the periods of darkness and chaos in our life. We rely on those people who are spiritual leaders, who are our mentors, who are the people who are in authority over us to extend that lifeline to the Lord, to model for us what it looks like to go out in faith. And Jesus, in relaying this to Matthew, is modeling for the disciples afterwards by telling the story, you need to be taking time alone to pray to prepare for the trials that will come, to prepare to be in the midst of the storm. Because if you don't, then you're going to get caught in the storm unawares. It's clear the disposition between Jesus and Peter. Jesus who prayed up and was expecting the storm. Peter who is reacting in the moment in his old boldness and leadership, but still is succumbed to fear. And the only difference between the two is that it's not specified whether Peter prayed or not. They're both doing the exact same thing. The only characteristic difference between what they're doing is whether one prayed beforehand or not. And that's the difference between sinking and standing on the water. Are you prayed up? Yes? I'm glad you mentioned the Jacob wrestling god at Peniel, the site. Mm -hmm. I suppose you used to name anything back then, it would stick. Uh, Because I'm very curious about a specific detail in that story which I think could probably relate to now, but why, why mention that God broke Jacob's hip? And mm. like the specific, it, it's it's always a puzzling detail to me, like why that's there. What you know, you're wrestling. There's going to be injuries, but like why that detail? I, I yeah, haven't thought about that much. But. Because it happened. There you go. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a weird, random detail to throw in there. I mean, it does have a symbolic relation to the fact that later on, the Jews would not eat the meat from the hip socket of animals in honor of Israel, of honor of of Jacob, and that kind of connection or touch point where God touched his hip and dislocated his hip out of its socket. But um, yeah, I think these details are in there. Or the other detail of the calming of the storm where Jesus is asleep below deck and his head is on a cushion. Who cares where his head is? But it's clear that like people were writing real details of real stories. Whether his head is on a cushion or not bears no theological significance whatsoever, you know. But it it shows that it is a true story that really happened. And so paying attention to those details is very important. It's good that we call those to mind. When Jesus turns the water to wine, do we know the number of jars and how much water they held? Those are details showing like this person isn't just making this up. Like there, it's a firsthand account. And they're conveying it so we can understand exactly the detail that they experienced and be invited into the mystery that happened there. So, yeah, I don't think it has any particular meaning other than it really happened. You know, it's one of those cool details that we have to show, like, this is a real historical um, record and not just some legend or some story. Yeah, Gage. Um, so we were talking about like, the fourth quarter or the fourth watch of the night yeah. and how... If I'm not mistaken, that's calculated by what constellation appears on the horizon and then reaches, I think, like the zenith of the sky. Possibly, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, then, my question is... Well, a- uh, yeah, if, ask it. I don't know if there's a way to figure out what constellations would have been over them. Oh, yeah, so I'm sure. That would, there would probably be something significant yeah. in that. Yeah, we can roll back star maps thousands of years because we know the pattern of movement in the skies. So... You could probably tell, even based on where this happens in in the time of year, you might be able to get it down to the exact season or maybe even month based on the feasts around it, what constellations were in the sky at that time. So, yeah, all I know about that is that that was the common division of watches uh, by Rome, and it became a commonplace way to talk about time. So it's not to imply that there were people watching. It's just to tell you what time it was. So all the disciples, it's not like two are watching and everyone else is asleep. Like, they're rowing. It's a storm. Like, they're, active, they're in the boat. It's just trying to tell you a detail about what time it is. But it's significant, I think, because of the Old Testament uh, details about that's the exact time Jacob is wrestling with God. Moses is parting the Red Sea and the people are going through it. So, 
But yeah, no, that'd be an interesting thing to look up. I'd be curious to see. So you look and I'll look and we'll see if we figure it out. We'll see how we're Yeah. <laughs> we'll see if we come to the same constellation. Yes, John. Yeah. Uh, one observation and then one question. So you know there's a I forgot which book verse in the Old Testament or which book, which book that way. Uh, where it says God is not in the wind and God is not in the something. Yes, yeah. first kings, it's Elijah, and yes. Yeah. It says God is in the silence. Yes. 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 So that was kind of. I'll give you one guess as to what the first reading is this Sunday. Yeah. It's that passage. <laughs> so the next question is: I mean, I know in a little sense he could hear was frightened by this storm mm -hmm. and the wind specifically. Yeah. So what is the like in the moral? Sense for how it applies to us. What are we supposed to be frightened of that would that would cause this type of mm. despair? Because yeah, I, I don't really, I, I don't fear any man. Mm -hmm. So should I fear myself? I mean, mm. like, what could you possibly do to me that I, you know, probably haven't done to myself much worse? You know, like, like sure. What, what does this mean to most people or to anyone? Like, yeah. Um, well, I make the distinction, I think the purpose of the story is not to tell us what we should fear, is that we shouldn't at all. But the type of fear that it's speaking against, I think, is you notice the detail where Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. And I think the fear is anything that could obstruct our connection to Jesus. That's what we should be most concerned about in our life. And so that's going to be different for each of us, whether it's the direct attack of the enemy, whether it's a particular temptation, an addiction, you know, um, whatever, an inappropriate inclination or relationship, whatever it is, something that we have an earthly attachment to, anything that could take our eyes off Jesus and onto whatever that is, that should be the thing, not that we should fear, but that we should have the most concern for because it risks us sinking. Oh, Jesus himself reminds us there's nothing we should fear because if only we cry out in those moments of despair, he'll be there immediately to outstretch his hand. Yeah, great question. Other questions or just words or things that stood out to you that you'd like to share? Yes, sir. I was wondering, uh, as we talked a little bit about it, because the, the disciples through the oral history would know that various prophets had done some of the things that Jesus had done. Yes. So uh, is this basically the time when they start really believing that he is the Son of Man? It's clear that at least the disciples that this is the time that they believe he is because they, they say it plainly at the very end of this, truly you are the son of God. And so it's clear that they've come to a conclusion different than the last time they had a storm, which at the end as I read, uh, where is it? It says, the men were amazed and said, what sort of man is this whom even the winds and the sea obey? Truly this is the son of God. So it's clear there is a development of faith and understanding who Jesus is at this point. Not that the disciples left because he told them to, but they're out. They obviously left late. They obviously didn't get where they were going. Mm -hmm. The fourth watch is like it is, but if you're sailing overnight, mm -hmm. then perhaps that's about a two and a half to three hour watch given that there's 10 to 12 hours. Yeah, it's from 3 to 6 a.m., yeah. It's, it's, it's still not light, and he's not there. Where, where he just left places where they were saying, Who is this guy? And you know him. And there's beginning to be some hostility to him. So why doesn't Jesus have one of them stay with him? Because you would think that at least one of them would have stayed with him at all times. Hmm. If he was someone to be protected and followed. I yeah, I mean, I think Jesus, we know these details that he was alone. As I said, that Jesus, he related them later. So I think one is that he's modeling what it means to be holy, what it means to be in relationship with God. That's one of the reasons in the Catechism for the Incarnation, to give us a model for holiness. That's one of the four reasons why Jesus became man, to give us a model for holiness. And one of the examples of that that's often pointed to is how many times Jesus goes off by himself to pray. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been al aligned with that pattern of behavior for him to just isolate one apostle to stay with him. I mean, Jesus is God. He doesn't need a bodyguard. You know, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he knows that this is going to end in his death. And he's a very controlled and uh, particular way in which he wants to bring that about. So I don't think he's at all concerned with his own safety. 
And I think the disciples know, well, this person who just multiplied bread and has been healing people kind of looks like he knows what he's doing. So let's just listen to him. And so when it says he commands that, is that what it says? He commands them. He made them. He made the disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side. It's clear they are just willing to be obedient at this point and trusting that, all right, this guy knows what he's doing. But it's also clear that their concept of what that's going to look like is still constantly being surpassed because they're surprised time and time again about what Jesus can do, the capability he has in our life. Another great lesson for us, you know, the times that we can often put Jesus in a box. This is what Jesus can do in my life. This is what I want Jesus to do in my life. And Jesus is expected, he's offering all these other options. You know, I've talked about this picture before. It's one of my favorites where there's a little girl holding a teddy bear and Jesus is reaching out a hand to grab it. And she's like, but I love it. And, and he, she doesn't see that he has an even bigger teddy bear in his other arm behind his back. And he's just waiting to give it to her, but she's clinging to this tiny little bear because she doesn't want to let it go. And that to me is like one of the best images for the spiritual life. Like just from here to here, just letting go and allowing God to give us what he wants to give us and not putting him or our expectations in a box and saying, this is what it's going to look like for my life to be good. If I have these relationships, this many friends, if I get into this school, if I have this job, if I make this much money, if my life like looks a certain Instagrammable way, then, then I'll be happy. Then I'll have arrived. And if you talk to most of those people, if you know most of those people who look like they have it all together, it's very clear that they're still looking, they're still hungry, and they don't have it together at all. We're all hungering for something that only God can fulfill. Only he can satisfy. And so the storms of life, the different things that distract us and take our gaze away from Jesus, those are the things we need to be most concerned about so that we can fix our eyes on Jesus. And when we fail, which we ultimately will, we, all, we, we can't do this on our own. We will mess up. But to immediately cry out, Lord, save me. Because most of us, what most of us do, will say, I'm not sinking. Everything's fine. I'm not saying, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm treading water. It's great. Don't worry about me. That's a way of, I, just, I needed a shower anyway. Like, you guys, don't worry, I'm fine. I can get out of this. Bring the boat over here. I'll get in the boat. I'll get in the boat, you know, and then we tip the boat over and everyone's in the water. You know, like we try and do it on our own. So if we have the ability to humbly say, like, I am, I am utterly useless on my own without the Lord. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. That's, that's one of the great lessons of this as well. Do we do that? Do we come to the Lord? Is he our first choice or is he our last resort? Other questions, points, things you'd like to share, things that stood out to you? Yeah. So what's the difference between Son of God and Son of Man? I know Ooh, Son of God great question. is used for angels as well. And yes. And Son of Man seems to be not a specifically Hebrew term. So, yeah, so Son of God, it's also used for Caesar. Caesar was called Son of God. So you would say, uh, Kaiser Kyrios, or, uh, yeah, Caesar is Lord. Uh, but one of the nicknames of like emperors or prominent rulers was they are a son of God. It was kind of this deification of the leader, kind of like Pharaoh was believed to be an embodiment of the sun god. And so the plague to kill or the plague of the death of the firstborn is to show that that kind of deification of Pharaoh wasn't true. Um, so it's this title that's often used. It can be used by angels. It can be used by, you know, anything like that. And so all it really, all it really shows us or communicates is that there's some divine or authoritative thing about this person that you're saying. Son of man, on the other hand, is a very specific title from the book of Daniel, where God is speaking to the prophet Daniel. And he's making a prophecy about the son of man is going to appear before the Ancient of Days, who is God on his throne, and he's going to come on the clouds in glory to pronounce judgment and to reign over all of the nations. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And again, I think it's mentioned Daniel 13, that title, Son of Man. And so the title that Jesus most often uses for himself is Son of Man. He doesn't often call himself the Messiah because he knows that's very, he know he is the Messiah. But he knows it's very charged language. Most people, when they would say Messiah, they thought political ruler, like King David, going to overthrow Rome. He didn't want them to have that idea. So he does acknowledge that he's the Messiah when people call him that, but he chooses to call himself the apocalyptic Old Testament figure who's coming in glory to redeem the world. So 
all those kind of titles of Jesus, very important significance and different. Um, Son of man pops up a lot in Matthew because of the Jewish you know, connection. So, yeah, great question. Okay, follow up. Yes. Is Daniel talking about this coming of Jesus or the second coming of Jesus? It's kind of one of those that can be interpreted as both and. Yes, yeah. Like, like a lot of prophetic and apocalyptic literature, in a lot of prophecies, there's usually a short-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. And so Isaiah, a lot of the things he preaches about, like the suffering servant that we apply to Jesus, there were also things that were short-term fulfillments about the kings that were ruling at that time, or about the nation of Israel itself being the suffering servant in exile. So there's always kind of these multi-layered fulfillments to truly supernatural or um, God-given prophecies and apocalyptic type of, of statements. So it's kind of a both. Yeah. And it's sometimes hard to tell, like in the Gospel of Matthew, when he, there's the eschatological discourse where Jesus is talking about the end of times, he kind of goes like, one verse will pivot and not warn you that he's talking about his, the fulfillment of his mission, and then all of a sudden he's talking about the end of the world. And you have to look very closely in the context to know which one he's talking about. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, John. While we're on the topic uh, just now, can you color the, you say that I am, uh, Response to the high priest uh, when talking about because I've always yes. I've never I don't know maybe it's because of the season I don't I don't really look into that weird response mm -hmm. I think it's odd and weird to this day like why didn't you just say yes I am mm -hmm. instead of saying I'm gonna say that I am mm -hmm. which just sounds very deflecting yes so yeah something that, I mean it's related to this question sure yeah so why does Jesus deflect and say, oh, okay, yes. I don't know. Is, that, is, that, is this just a translation issue? Is it every single uh, translation potentially, issue? yeah. Like every translation is the same like, essence almost. Sure, yeah. So I would say it's clear Jesus has said he is elsewhere, leading up to that point. Uh, all over the Gospel of John where he makes the I am statements, anytime he uses that, that name of God, it has a very particular uh, conjugation in Greek, ego emi. Um, and so anywhere that happens, we can know like Jesus here is claiming divinity. He's claiming the name of God. Um, so when he doesn't, there's often you would look at that. There's something particular about that context as to why he would deflect it. And so when they ask him, are you the king of the Jews? That's what he says. You say that I am. Because the question is really not asking the right thing. What they're asking is, are you a threat to Herod? Are you a threat to Caesar? They're not asking, have you come to save us? Are you the Messiah? And if they're asking if he's the Messiah, they're thinking, have you come to overthrow Rome? So what he's saying is, all the things you think I am, like, that's, that's just what you're saying. I'm not, he's not going to admit to something that he's not, even though he really is the king of kings. But what they're asking is something different. And so because so many prophecies also about Jesus' crucifixion, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of, um, emphasize that he is an innocent, spotless victim. Him to admit anything that could be accused of as a crime would go against him fulfilling those Old Testament prophecies, specifically in like the suffering servant songs of Isaiah. And so he maintains a posture where if you were to look at that in a court of law today, he claims no guilt. There is nothing that actually can be authentically uh, placed upon him as an accusation of guilt. And so because he deflects it, he's not admitting anything and he retains his innocence even though the court you could say that he was in was skewed against him. So I would say those are probably two particular reasons. They're asking him something different that he can't agree with, and he's choosing not to claim something that could be brought against him as guilty so he can maintain his innocence as a spotless victim. Yeah, great question. You guys scare me when you start asking questions not associated with the reading. I never know, I never know what is going to happen. So, but I like it. Uh, any final thoughts, questions, Greg? If I, if you said something before with the word Kaiser. Yes. And usually we attribute that to like being a, I don't want to say a king, or like a yeah. kind of term in society or whatever, but you kind of mentioned Kaiser, then you mentioned Caesar. Yeah, they share the same root. The German word for Caesar? Kaiser is the German word for king. I think Caesar is the word for king or emperor. Czar is another derivation of that, yeah, from that time. So Caesar wasn't a name, it was a title. So that's why you have Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. It means like Jesus, uh, Julius is king or emperor, Augustus is king. So they were them saying Kaiser Curios was Caesar is Lord. And that's why it became so prevalent at the time to say um, Christo, or 
what was the common saying? Christos Kyrios? Jesus Kyrios? Jesus is Lord. So it's kind of like a thumb in the face to the Roman authorities. Using that title that was one delineated only for a secular ruler and applying it to Jesus, who was a lowly carpenter who was convicted to death in a very you know, embarrassing and humiliating way. Um, it was kind of a, a you know, what, what have you back at Rome, you know? So, yeah, but it is a, it's a term, it's a title, yeah. <coughs> Any other final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. one more. So I, 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 I thought I was right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the same you were connected in Luke 22, it says that he was not God. Okay, so, maybe that's in one of the other gospel yeah, accounts. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I, think, I think we're both right. Actually. Yeah. So that makes it even harder. It's, it's like very, because I, you know, I, I always know like martyrdom, right? Mm -hmm. If you can ask that question, you got a gun to your head. It's like, you know, you have to respond yeah. in the affirmative. Yeah. You must. I mean, and I felt like that was always his moment. Of, mm -hmm. Give me an affirmative answer. This is it. You're, you're going to die. Like, mm. it's any last words. You know, I am not God. Sure. So, like, the, the and then in, in Luke it says, you say so, which is very similar. Yeah. But again, I, I don't know. Um, I like the first answer in, in, in the, I think it was Matthew John, mm -hmm. but when I, when I see it so clear, he's being asked, like, who are you? Yeah. yeah I don't know. I'm not satisfied. But. Sure. I mean, that's why I would kind of play out, well, what would happen if he had said, I am? He still would have been crucified. Yeah. You know, there, there's no difference in conclusion, but being able to claim the innocence as the spotless victim to fulfill that prophecy, I think is what's key there. Because no matter if he had revealed that to those authorities, it wouldn't have made a difference. And if anything, it would have inhibited their free will to be able to freely acknowledge him because he would have just openly admitted it. You know, Jesus often, God often gives us just enough evidence to where we still need to have faith. He'll never just be like, here's all the questions you've ever had about faith just revealed to you, downloaded to your brain, and now you can just live a life in glorious relationship with me. Like, no, there, he'll give us just enough, just enough to where we still have to have that step of faith. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's foolish, but it means that it takes that surrender. Because otherwise, if it were easy, it, it wouldn't really be faith. It would just be a natural thing that everybody did. And so we have to ask ourselves also, Am I willing to make that leap of faith? Am I willing to surrender to the one who can walk on water, walk on the face of the deep, conquer death, conquer darkness, conquer anything that you and I will face? Am I willing to allow him to carry me across those waters to him? Or do I start to look at the storm, to get distracted by sin, and begin to sink? Do I recognize the power Jesus can have in my own life if I let him? Because we have a great example of boldness and faith in Peter, but also a good example of our fallen humanity when we turn our eyes away from Christ and we focus too readily on how big and large and scary the storm might be. So whatever is going on in your life, whatever is bringing you anxiety, stress, worry, doubt, fear, loss, grief, grades, family, drama, whatever it is, Jesus can walk on the face of it. And he can bring you there too. He can pull you up from that place where you feel like you're sinking. Immediately, all we must do is come to him and say, Lord, save me. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this time in your word, for the gift of all the people here, all of the wisdom that was shared in the questions that were asked. And I just thank you, Lord, for this hunger that we all have to know you more in your word. I pray that you bless us each in the ways that you most need it. Awaken in us a desire to know you more, to study your word, to follow your teachings, to live out our faith with boldness and joy, and to recognize we will mess up, we will have storms, we will fail and fall, but you are always there to pull us up if we ask. And so we pray, God, that we would have faith in you as not just a person who lived 2,000 years ago who we have nice stories about, but the God of the universe who became man so that he could save us from sin and suffering and death. And so the ways we experience glimmers, difficulties of that darkness, help us to allow you to pull us up out of the waters and bring us back home. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.